you know there are services like Zoom that these days they have a highly increased uh, user base so I was reading an article something like that so uh, Zoom's daily active users jumped from uh, 10 million to over uh, 200 million in three months and you know why because <laughs> people are doing a remote work and they uh, do not use the normal they don't visit the offices so I was just thinking about uh, telling you guys or sharing the information I have about how do these companies basically uh, scale up and serve so many users so think from a technical point of view so from a technical point of view uh, if you have let's say one um, hundred servers or whatever serving your users so now serving from hundred to or from uh, 10 to 200 million users in three months how would you your service will just crash right so uh, I will tell you how that's exactly where uh, our containerization and uh, microservices and Nginx uh, these kind of tools and services and technologies uh, come into help to deal with situations uh, situations and I'm sure Zoom is uh, using probably a very similar approach to this so let's try to uh, get it so first of all uh, now we're writing back a bit of our back right so we had this um, um, back end service uh, written uh, in the series so we had uh, one back end in our uh, cluster one DB and now front end and uh, the front end also included a reverse proxy that will run at 4012 and that's the uh, file for the reverse proxy the configuration that we did so last time we talked about some caching on the reverse proxy caching server responses and that was our server anyway so uh, one thing I uh, made uh, one thing I changed before the start of this video was that in app.js uh, I added a small uh, directive or a small REST API endpoint slash ping so uh, to to make you guys a good understanding of what we are going to do exactly today. So server name is just going to return uh, the server that this or the container name or any na server name that this particular service is running on. So uh, why are we going to do that? So first let's talk with a little bit of a picture, right? So. If you look at this so we have uh, let's say consider a scenario as we talked about zoom so let's say this is zoom's architecture and you have a lot of users coming in these days so this jump from 10 million to let's say 200 million and then what do zoom would do zoom has just one uh, domain name that's uh, there for you so users don't know if there's another server <laughs> serving them to just come to let's say zoom.tv or doom.com whatever and then on the back end probably that's a uh, some sort of reverse proxy that zoom also has where they abstract where they create an abstraction from the users but for it, how many services they are running on and this gives them an advantage the key advantage here the key advantage is that they can scale up to thousands of hundreds of user uh, new service right and then the proxy they can just tell their proxy to uh, load balance their requests or load balance the number of users being served onto these backends and they can scale up to uh, as much users as possible given that they can buy more servers or <laughs> of course they can give more resources to it but from a technical point of view that's the idea and ho I hope you get it and we talked about this quite a lot in the previous load balancing video but today I'm going to show it to you in a more um, interesting way with also with a bit of kubernetes interaction introduction so kubernetes is something that's called a container orchestration we will do a proper video series about it but today uh, i just want to show you i ordered that uh, the work that was supposed to be done for you guys so you don't guys waste much time so if i just show you my kubernetes cluster so in kubernetes a container is just a pod okay uh, a pod can have several containers but just for your understanding, uh, if you know Docker, you should know that it's just running to, uh, container, container, right? So what I did, uh, I already ran uh, three different replicas of our backend, our simple node backend, according to this architecture. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm going to see that these three replicas are basically served on specific addresses. So uh, 31300, and that's the server name that I'm using right now. So first of all, we go ahead, just we will just ping this guy up. 300 slash ping, perfect. So that's our backend zero, right? And then I go ahead and I ping 
two, yeah, and one will return back in dash one, right? That's important. That tells you which server is being served from. And now what we would do, these particular URLs will be accessed by my front-end reverse proxy that was here. So we had one URL. Now we want to load balance from this point of our code, right? So let's start writing the code for it. So uh, within your server blocks, let's come here and do upstream backend. And uh, then we are going to just um, put our backend addresses in here. So upstream is also just a server that just does the upstreaming for you. So we'd like to add a small, uh, um, comment on it, and I will say 168.0.1063.1300. And that's going to be my first server that I'm going to serve you, going to be serving on. Yep, that seems correct. And then I'm just going to copy that and put two in one here, right? That should be the correct IP, right? And then this backend will just come here and guess what if you have uh, Kubernetes or any orchestration engine that you're using you have replicated backends like I have here three of them are serving and I have three of the services that are telling you where they are being hosted which is on my current machine right now and on three different ports that's all you need to do to do the load balancing and hide any server failures as well as any server scale ups or scale downs from a particular user right so that's really really powerful so let's go ahead and i will just run this uh, with our normal docker compose so sudo docker compose up i just want to build my um, front end container where i created the proxy basically okay okay perfect so I will just see the port that my proxy was, oh, it's this one, right? 4012, the port where my proxy used to run. Now, what I'm gonna do, I'm going to go to this uh, URL, 192.168.0.1063. Um, dot zero dot zero and I'm gonna say 4012 slash ping. Now, as soon as I hit this URL, guys, the most interesting thing that's going to happen for me is that I will be routed to one of these three servers by Nginx and it will be hiding or I don't really know as a user unless I of course write my <laughs> host name to the HTTP response uh, that which user is being served from me and that's where the control comes to the real cloud hosting people right there you go so the first request was served from back on zero but this can of course change uh, let me just open Firefox I hope it's just too soon usually it's not that nice to me I've been trying that stuff for quite a while <laughs> but it will do trust me it will I need to refresh god damn it oh perfect so finally it did so now you can see that my requests are being served from uh, backend one. And right now, Nginx is just using the uh, uh, round robin fashion here. There is no fancy stuff, but guess what? We can do more fancy stuff to it. So here, requests are still back in one I want to see two as well, I hope. No, probably it has uh, pushed my particular IP address with this particular server. I hope something happens. Oh, perfecto. So there you go. So backend two is being served from the same exact URL, right? Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, let's say, so today, consider a scenario where uh, COVID-19 situation, I hope it will, will be solved right now, right? So now Zoom says, okay, I'm not gonna serve 200 million users right now, so I will serve a bit less users than what is this. So what they're gonna do, they're gonna scale down their stuff. So in Kubernetes, uh, don't worry about if you don't understand this particular part that I'm gonna do, but just know that uh, conceptually you should know what I'm doing. So I reduced my replicas from three to one, and uh, I want to apply this deployment to the, actually it's a stateful set, but don't worry about this stuff. This is, uh, you shouldn't care that much about. 
So then I, if I try to get my, usually it takes a bit of time for these guys to uh, basically take the terminate the backends. So yeah, so you can see that uh, two of my pods or containers um, backend two is being terminated because I set the replica set to uh, close the replicas to to scale down to replica one. So I don't have a lot of users as there anymore. So uh, here we go. Let's just wait a little bit. Okay, perfect. So back into his terminate. So when I refresh, it's impossible that my requests would ever be ready to back into it. As you can see, I refreshed, I'm back to back in zero. And uh, after this terminates, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Get pod, but still terminating. And there's still a chance that my, my request might go to back in one at some point of time. But I assure you, <laughs> After a while, okay, say this one was at back in one, and there you go, back in zero okay, for the Firefox guy. So now uh, that's exactly how we save our costs with the microservices architecture, and that's why our system is quite scalable, right? That is the main point of why I make all this video. We, we already talk about load balancing, where we talk about reverse proxies and scalability, and that's exactly where it helped. So uh, that's pretty cool, but I would like to tell you a little bit bonus stuff about all this. So in Nginx, you can do a lot of interesting things that you can see on my screen. Just zoom in a bit. So the first directory of directive that basically is here is that uh, we have um, a few strategies for the load balancing. The first one is route bar robin, which we are using right now, right? Uh, since I was just a single machine right now, so that's why it wasn't uh, doing any kind of round robin for me because I just one guy accessing it right now. So if you have concurrent reasons coming in, then of course it's gonna do the round robin uh, stuff for you. So the second strategy that I uh, know is the least connections one, so it keeps uh, the weights of the server in the account, so I will tell a little bit about what weights are, so in your internet configuration, so you can give the weights to your uh, server depending on the fact that uh, how strong uh, one of your servers is, some servers have more resources, some have less, so you can say, let's say my server one has more resources, so I can say uh, five request, the ratio of uh, the division between request would be five to one, and let's say to one again, right? I hope you understand what I mean. And here I can say least connections. And that's Nginx will just change its behavior completely to that, right? And also if my server is down or I wanna do anything like that, I can always write down here. Or there's also another interesting uh, a way that I personally do in my even production workloads. Yep, I do that. So um, that scenario is, goes like this. So there is a small problem with this. So what happens is that, so let's say you have your server and you have a session for a currently locked in user in your um, backend. So what you would do, so let's say you are serving three different backends to the user, right? So one server goes uh, down or goes whatever, you know, uh, the user comes over there and um, your new server, your request is being routed to the new server. So currently, suddenly, while you're using the system, you are locked out of the system, right? That's really common scenario to happen in such situations. To deal with that, Nginx provides us with this uh, directory called IP hash. So what it will do, it will uh, attach a particular IP of the user to a particular server. So. Uh, as soon as you have the same IP, uh, your uh, all your requests are always going to go to a particular server, whatever Nginx uh, attaches to it in the background. And moreover, to get a bit of fault tolerance, what I do for my workloads, I say, okay, let's say this one of this my servers is weak, so I say max fails is three, fail underscore timeout is let's say thirty seconds, right? So uh, Nginx will see, okay, whenever this server request comes, and if there is a max fail of three on the server, it's going to uh, forget the server for a while, and it's not gonna route any requests to this user ever. And one important thing to notice is that uh, this also provides us a lot of fault tolerance. So users never see an error like, uh, okay, 404, <laughs> that the server has failed or any kind of, stuff like that. So that's very, 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 and very powerful 
architecture, very scalable and uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it and you can read a bit more about it on the Nginx documentation. They have also some TCP or HTTP hell tech stuff that I personally use a lot in my production workloads. So uh, thanks for watching the videos and I pretty, uh, I'm pretty hopeful that you learned something from it and uh, until next video I hope you stay and I hope the COVID-19 situation is gone. So uh, good luck and good luck and thanks for watching uh, and have a nice uh, day. Bye. And please subscribe to my channel if that really supports my work. <laughs> thanks. Bye.